Welcome to the Tax Alpha Solutions Podcast, hosted by Matt Chancy. Matt is a tax consultant, author, and certified financial planner with almost two decades helping his clients grow their net worth. On the show, Matt brings together an array of specialists to share with you their experience and success along with strategies of the 1%. Matt Chancy is with Coastal One, member FINRA SIPC. And now, here's your host, Matt Chancy. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Matt Chancy with another episode of the Tax Alpha podcast. And here today, we are with John Reed. John uh, has helped insurance advisors with over 200 premium finance cases, resulting in over $2.4 billion of coverage, $450 million of finance premiums, and over $56 million of first-year commissions. His focus is helping clients navigate the premium finance lending component and to streamline the process from when client gives the green light to when their policy is funded in an order. John is originally from a small farm in Ohio. Corn was on that farm, he had told me on a recall, and is a former aerospace engineer and has sailed across two oceans. John, nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Matt. Good to see you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Well, interesting. I want to go back to the oceans thing right now. So tell me about the two oceans and the sailing thing. I find that to be very interesting. I, me too, by the way. Sailing is, uh, it gets me pumped up every time. I don't know if you can see in the background, there's a little half hull of a catamaran. That was my first, uh, my first ocean crossing was in 2019. We competed in the Transpac, which is the Trans-Pacific Yacht Race. And it's, uh, it's from Long Beach, California to Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I fell into sailing. I, when I was in Ohio, I was in grad school and I'd always dreamt of living on a sailboat for a year and spending time just seeing the world from the sea. It, it was enchanting to me. And so when I moved to California and, and ended up in Newport Beach by complete luck, I took sailing lessons and, and got onto a racing crew and started sailing here competitively. And there was an opportunity for a team that was doing an ocean crossing to jump on their crew. So that was my, my first crossing. We were at sea for 14 days. Uh, it's a 2,250 mile race. So it's almost like, it's almost like sailing from home here to home back in Ohio. Uh, 14 days at sea, six people on the boat. We were the longest boat at sea, but we won our class because the other boats had to give us time because we were at a deficit for uh, the size and speed of our boat. But that was my first crossing. So uh, we you know, went from across the Pacific Ocean. And then that crew, the captain of that boat, decided after that, he kind of caught the racing bug and decided he wanted to go faster. So he commissioned a new boat. And it was completed in October in the south of France. And the, our crew flew back over, met him in Europe, picked up his new catamaran, and we sailed it across the Atlantic Ocean in November. So that was a, I ended up at sea about 3,300 miles, 17 days at sea. And uh, that was just a, it's incredible. But the, I think the low key coolest part about sailing in the middle of the ocean is uh, stargazing. Just having absolutely no light pollution, time to look at the stars and, and just see what's out there. And just imagine what it would have been like a couple hundred years ago to see that sky every night. Um, it's pretty amazing, but it's nice. It, you know, the other thing is I think it, it, you think of it like a space crew when you're on a, if you're on a space voyage, you have your crew and you have your ship and that's all you have. And when you're crossing an ocean, it's the same thing. You, you have to make do, you, you have to navigate the the waters, but also personalities and, and emotions. And, you know, we luckily we've had no issues. I think there was one situation where I wanted a, a certain dashboard on the screen and the captain didn't want it because he was afraid it would turn off autopilot and, and that was the most heated moment we had in 17 days was a disagreement on what should be on the screen for our, uh, our chart plotter, but it was amazing. So we got to, we got to do that. We're planning to be, we're going to compete in two years for the Transpac to Tahiti that goes from California to Tahiti. So we'll, we'll cross an equator. That'll be another, another thing to check off. Nice. Uh, okay. Look, being a lay person, somebody that's never done something like that before, it sounds terrifying, right? Like I can't imagine being 14 days or whatever, seven days when you're in the middle of it or eight days away from dry land or whatever. That just sounds, were there ever any scary moments? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on the first crossing, not, not as many. I think the scariest moments were that we were in a race, so you had to hand steer. So it's much different than just having autopilot on point and shoot, you know, just have the boat drive itself. Basically when we were hand steering and you're under sail, 
and you're going downwind, there's a, you know, the boat has to be kept in a certain direction with the wind. Otherwise the sails fall down or things happen. And so the scariest part about the trans pack was just keeping the sails full and the boat healthy, because if you mess up that you could break the boat. Now you're in trouble. So it's avoiding trouble. Um, we had a real problem on the way uh, across the Atlantic ocean though. We had some sailing issue. It's some sail issues with the halyard. We like, we broke a halyard, which takes the, the big sail up the front of the boat and we had some plumbing issues. It was a new boat. And so our shower didn't work right. So it was a little, little musky in there, but on our, on day 15, we're 350 miles from shore. And it was our last day of fresh food. We still had canned food. We had dehydrated food, but it was our last day of anything fresh. We'd gone through everything in the fridge and freezer and perishable. Um, and we'd enjoyed that. And we're, all of us were on top of the boat. We were in the, the, the cabin or at the helm and sunsets going down and we start smelling smoke and that's bad. That's bad. We can't find the source of the smoke, but we can smell it. And we go through the galley and, and all the electronics and we, there's nothing. We're in the engine compartments. And then the, the starboard hull starts to fill with visible smoke and it's uh, cloudy and it's fully penetrating the entire, the hull and um, you can't see anything. And eventually we find the source of it is electronic component underneath one of the beds down below we start going into that it's just now plummeting filling the whole boat with smokes we're afraid our our hull is on fire we can't find the source of this Uh, we start shooting fire extinguishers at it and try to put it out it's not going out we're monitoring it can't figure out what to do and then it breaks into fire we're on fire in the middle of the ocean so we you know it's kind of it was really interesting matt because there's five people on the boat And everyone reacted differently. The captain goes in to put out the fire mode. So he knows the boat. He knows the layout. He knows the electrical system. He knows where everything's at. And so he's diving right into under the bunk with the fire. We have one fire extinguisher left because we'd already used them all. Um, He's calling for water. So I'm, you know, we're getting water down into it. We're trying to put on electrical fire with water at this point because it's all we had left. And we, we were close enough that we thought we'd be, we'd be on shore in a day or two. So we just started using all our drinking water to put this fire out. And uh, the only thing we saved was our emergency bottle. There's like an emergency bottle that we put on the life raft if we had to abandon ship. Um, I went in to make sure the captain doesn't die, make sure nobody on the boat dies mode. That's the risk tolerance guy. So everyone got their their life jackets on. We had the life raft, uh, you know, unobstructed, ready for deployment. We had food and water ready to go. Um, and I was clearing space behind us as we were putting, you know, going through things to make sure I could carry the cap. Then I put, I grabbed a mask and I stood by his side while we were in the fire because I was afraid he was going to pass out. I was afraid he was going to go down. And so then we had one guy who just basically would do anything we yelled for. So we had our doer guy, our gopher, uh, the most experienced guy grabbed the helm and actually drove the boat because when we killed the power and the autopilot went out again, like you can get into big trouble. We're under sail in the middle of the night now. And guy number five grabbed his phone and recorded the whole thing. And he called Mayday, um, which so give, we, so give me a happy ending. Come on. We ended up getting the fire out. We you know, figured out the, where it was at in the electrical system. The captain's a computer engineer, cut this component out of the circuitry. Everything eventually stopped smoking. We sailed through the night in complete darkness because we were uh, with no power. We'd killed the power for this. So we had just battery powered running lights. Next day, we you know debunked everything, figured out what worked, what didn't, made an emergency uh, stop in Antigua instead of going to the U.S. Virgin Islands. We're all alive. The boat's fine. Maybe $2,000 of damage was the total thing, but there's 15 minutes of total fear. I guess the, the big highlight is we got the whole thing on, on camera. You know, in the moment, you're I'm ticked off. I'm like, why is he recording this? Why isn't he doing something? But now we have this just amazing documentary of, I mean, uh, one of the scariest moments of my life. Yeah, could have but gone I really think, bad. I think that's what I think that's what anything is like, though. You, the biggest lesson I've learned from sailing, Matt, is the scariest moments in the moment become the highlight reel when you remember it. Yeah, you know, it's like there's 16 other days at sea, and most of them are kind of a blur, but that one's not. That's the yeah. highlight reel. So it's taught me to embrace chaos, embrace fear, embrace those scary moments. I remember that going through them and, and succeeding and getting by is going to be what makes things fun to remember. Yeah. Interesting. So. That's a, that's a great perspective on that. You know, you said a couple of things in there that I've <laughs> talked about with friends before and I'm like, 
can you imagine the first people that were ever like in Europe or wherever and like, you know what? We're going to get on this boat and we're just going to go that way. And we're going to see what's there. Like We don't know if there's anything in there or not. So those boats didn't move like your boat. They didn't have the safety precautions. They didn't have the way to transport food and water and all the other stuff. And they didn't even know how long they were going to, if they're to ever come back or not. Imagine either what your life had to be like to run away from that at that point in time, or what a adventure risk taker you were to just go, I don't even know what this is going to turn into, but I'm willing to try, right? Like yeah. imagine the mindset of something like, and heck, there were people back then that thought the earth was flat, right? So like, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't imagine it, you know, just looking even at the route we went, they talked about, we basically rerouted one of Christopher Columbus's routes. So we went from Grand Canary to, to Antigua, that's a, that's a Christopher Columbus route. And we did it in 17 days. And I just, I thought the same thing while we're out there is, can you imagine doing this without a weather update, without a GPS, without I'm texting my wife while I'm down in my bunk, you know, it's with a satellite phone. Just imagine being completely plugged in and hearing every creak and every wave and just being out there and never knowing what's, what the end is going to be. Yeah. And then you hit something and you're like, what is it? Like, I don't even know where I'm at. Like, what is this place? Oh, there's people. <laughs> there's people. Oh, they don't like us very much. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, that, it, it was an amazing adventure. Uh, there's a funny, if you ever look at it, there's a uh, an advertisement from Ernest Shackleton for one of his voyages. And it's it's a great call to action for a sailor. It's it's like there's danger and it's unlikely that we're going to be successful or that you're ever going to come back. But if we do, you're going to have all the glory in the world. Yeah, Sign up below. Really interesting. Very interesting. So, you know, it's funny. I'll ask you this question. You might have a perspective on it. Ironically, this morning I was in St. Petersburg and I was walking around the marina mm -hmm. and something that jumped out to me in a very obvious way was it's full of boats, right? But it looked to me like 80% of the boats had moved in such an extended period of time. Literally, there were like the ropes tying them off were like barnacled up or something almost. Like, like there seems to be like a graveyard of dead boats in that marina. Are all marinas like that? And is that a problem? Yeah, I think so. I think you'll always find them. The it depends on how active the marina is. Sometimes they'll, you know, have an annual inspection. Like in Newport Beach, there's a annual. Um, an annual requirement that your boat in order to stay in Newport beach has to under its own power, leave the Marina, go out and be able to come back. And so it's just to show that it's not staying, it's not stuck there. It's not a derelict boat. And I think so. I think people get into, you know, get into yachting, get into sailing. And sometimes you find just sitting on the dock is fine. It satisfies what you want. It's like camping, right? You don't have to go backpacking into the middle of the wilderness and the forest, which is what I think of sailing is like when you're in a you know, big blue ocean sailing. You can just throw a tent in the backyard and it's pretty fun. Uh, you can grab an RV and, and park it in a lot. And I think that's what people turn their boats into pretty often. But Interesting. Um, no, it's, it's unfortunate though, right? You, you hate seeing a, a beautiful piece of uh, machinery in a, a boat turn into a, a barnacle graveyard. Right. And I've heard, you know, and I know that the Bay Area in California has had some issues with, I guess, I don't know what to call it, squatters, I guess, per se, on mm. boats in the Bay Area up in San Francisco, California, or whatever, but kind of part of an extension, I think, of the homeless issue or whatever that's going on in there. I don't know. Anyway, just not trying to get off tangent, but I didn't know that I was going to be on a call with a sailor this morning. So I just yeah. found it really interesting and super intellectually. I'm just, I think I'm just an intellectually curious person. And I happen to have somebody that knows a little bit about it. I'll tell you, Matt, the, the best thing you can do if you're curious about it is get on board a boat and go out because I don't know if you've gone sailing before or spent much time on sailboat. Power boating's fun. Uh, you can go fast and it's very luxurious, but I think there's, there's something about, you know, taking the boat out, getting out of the Harbor and the moment when the engine gets turned off, when there's no sound of the combustion happening, you hear three things. You hear the water, you hear the wind and you hear the boat. And it's just this moment of purity. And it's so enjoyable. Interesting. Well, I'm going to have to, uh, one of those fancy catamaran things. Does that qualify? You come out, I'll, we'll take you out. <laughs> the next time you're out here, we'll go out. All right. Sounds good. I get out there a fair amount. So I'll have to take you up on that. Yeah, it's so nice. And, and the other thing is, if you have clients who sail, just being able to plug into that community is pretty awesome too. Um, there's something about it. You know, It's just that I'm going to figure it out attitude. And mm -hmm. when you're at sea, there's, 
it's kind of like people talk about with golfing, right? You can only, you only have the tools that are in your bag when you're sailing and you're off, <laughs> you're on, you're detached. You've That's unplugged it. the umbilical. It's just you and the boat, what you got on the boat and what you got here. Yeah. By the time that whatever problem or issue comes up needs to be fixed, there's probably, if you can't fix it yourself, it's probably going to be that event's going to be over before help can get there in a meaningful way. So it can be. Yeah. And it's, it, I think it's great for just this resilience building too. You just get into this attitude that you can figure out how to get out of problems and that's good. Gotcha. Well, that probably yeah. spins into a little bit because you have an engineering background. So being able to tinker and solve problems like that probably fits your core being who you are. Other people out there be like, ah, you know, so. Yeah. Well, and the same thing, right? Growing up on a farm, it's, you know, I grew up in a pretty poor farm. It wasn't very productive. It was more of a hobby farm than anything. My folks moved out of Cleveland, went south as far as they could afford to drive to work every day and bought this plot of land and it was a cornfield and they farmed it and we had about a hundred head of sheep. Uh, my mom would spin the wool and you, know, you just, you had to deal with things. So you had to fix stuff on the farm. And that's something I just grew up tinkering ever since I was a little kid. Uh, even when I was in college, you know, I, I moved to Cincinnati when I was in college, I had this old Honda Civic that I bought for cash after my first, uh, my first engineering co-op job. And I couldn't afford to fix it. So I had to learn how to do everything on it, whether it was, you know, the alternator or the exhaust or, or the radio. I mean, I, I did everything on that car because I had to, I couldn't afford not to. And I'm so blessed, I think, to have had to learn that at a young age. Sure. Yeah. Resilience. I had a similar type car. So I get <laughs> As a matter of fact, I had a Honda. I had the CRX, the Civic CRX. Yeah, nice. Little two door. Yeah, the little two door. So yeah, that's it's good. Good on gas mileage back then. And that was important, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. And again, it's like the same thing. It's like those were those hard moments become the highlight reel. It's how you get sure. through it. Sure. So let's pivot. I apologize. We got on a tangent. I just found that super interesting. And I think it, it humanizes what we do as people sometimes, you know, we're not just, we're people too, you know, we're not just people that have a specific skill set. So, you know, you got in and on our pre-call, we kind of talked, you know, you were a former engineer 2013, you know, a downturn in the economy a little bit, I guess, in the engineering space, you pivoted into the life insurance world. And then since 2015, specifically, you've kind of focused on joint work in the premium finance space. So, Let's take that from the kind of the ground up a little bit. Number one, um, I think we should talk about what is premium finance just from a very basic standpoint for people that may or may not be familiar with the concept. Sure. So, yeah, so that the timeline's pretty close. The um, I got into life insurance. I was in business school and engineering school at the same time. And so I got the Northwestern Mutual guy call me and say, hey, have you ever thought about buying life insurance? My response was, I'm a 22-year-old graduate student, and no. <laughs> and, uh, but I appreciated his tenacity. I'd never been called by someone who was a financial advisor and asked to be a client before, and I admired that. I, I admired that, that approach. And so whenever I was going for my engineering job, I gave him my start date, and I told him, hey, like, here's the day I'm starting my new job. I had this great job offer. Um, I was going to be managing a, a research and development department of an aerospace manufacturer that was doing carbon fiber inlays. And there was a reorg in the company. My job got rescinded. New CEO came in, wanted to hire everybody. And my Northwestern guy called me on the day he said he was going to call me. So that was another good lesson. For one, the outreach was important. I felt valued by the call. Number sure. two is that he followed through on what he said he was going to do. I'm going to call you on this date. And he did. And I told him, hey, no, no deposit, no return. I can't, I can't do any financial planning because I don't have a job. And then Northwestern recruited me. So I did that for a handful of years. And really my, my mindset at that point was that I wanted to use insurance as a way to make an impact. I wanted to go and be valuable to other people who were business owners. That was the only way I was going to try this industry out was if I could find a way to help people who are already making an impact, worry less about their financial future and worry more about their business and what's important to them. And that led to me saying, how do I work with the, the most impactful people? And to me, the way I define most impactful is most employees, most profitable business, um, your biggest impact businesses that they were doing. I think you know, if you help a billion people, you can become a billionaire. And so I said, the bigger the client, that's what I wanted to focus on. And they also use insurance more regularly. So I, I focused on whole life insurance um, when I was with Northwestern Mutual, moved to a bank and started working on more, the whole you know, gamut of permanent products. But in 2014, when I moved to California, I got introduced to someone who really had streamlined distribution of 
premium financing for life insurance. And I put my engineering hat on and said, okay, this seems too good to be true. Let's dig into it. And it, that was really when I learned more about uh, leverage, learned about using loans, learned about how to use financing strategically. Um, I started learning about from a bank's perspective about their risk tolerance and the cost of capital. So what type of assets they fund at different, at different price points. Um, digging into tax code and understanding where loans to a trust versus gifts to a trust, how that works from a, from a macro perspective. And it, once it all clicked, I said, you know, this is absolutely brilliant. I want to focus on this. And so the way I would describe premium financing, very simply, it's, it's only two things at its core. Uh, it's a permanent life insurance product and a third party loan to finance it. And when you put those two together, that's what premium financing is. It's no different than financing any other commercial asset or, or capital asset. You know, there's definitely minutia inside there, but at its core, that's, you know, that's what it is. I think the other big differences are if you think about how many people fund the funding schedule of a life insurance policy, many people either structure them as a lifetime pay or some type of limited pay product. We go the other route with premium financing generally. We look at what is the, what's the legal limit to funding? How much can we fund how fast? Because we're using borrowed money. We want to fund that product as quickly as possible up front. That way, all that tax-free compounding and efficiency can happen inside the contract in a faster route. And so that's the big difference, I think. Um, I typically advise clients that when they're financing this, you know, one of the things that's kind of in the marketing that's out there is... Uh, you know, buy now and, and get insurance for free. There, there's, there's different strategies people present as a reason to buy it. I look at financing as simply as this, is that if a client needs to buy an insurance policy for a state or business transfer planning, that's number one. If they don't have a need for the insurance, there's no reason to continue the conversation. Number two is that a family or an entity that has the capital means to fully fund that policy that's got to be on the table too. It can't be someone who doesn't have the capability of funding a contract. And number three, this is, you know, this is, I think the kicker is that a family or a business that has a better use of capital, they're more efficient to deploy their money into their business, their real estate, their investment portfolio, or keep it invested in those places due to tax consequences. That's a perfect client to consider premium financing because they could benefit from the life insurance for the transfer tax capability. They have the means to pay for it, but the opportunity cost is too high. Now, that's what I look for. And so with those three fact patterns, that's, that's what we use to get started. Sure, sure. Makes sense. Um, curious question. You still have any of those relationships with Northwestern Mutual back in the day from where you started? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I do. I, uh, I actually, it's funny, I'm working on a case right now with one of the guys, the, actually the advisor who, um, I still own my life insurance. I still own some Northwestern Mutual insurance. And the advisor who I asked to be my rep of record, he also manages my parents, their things, um, my step families and mine. And he actually has a case now that we're working on together. So I've stayed, I've stayed in touch with almost everybody through my career. I, I'm not a, a burn bridges or cut ties guy. I worked on a case last year that came from a Northwestern advisor. And, and I, I think it might've been the largest case. It's the largest case I've ever heard of. Um, and it came from a Northwestern advisor out on the East coast. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, look, the knowing what you know about the financial services system, Northwestern is a great recruiting engine, right? They are great at recruiting. They have great brand equity because they market themselves in a very good way. And people, if you say Northwestern Mutual, they know who you are. Um, I think their reps, their struggle by and large, because there's no uh, documented track to success other than recruiting other people that come into the business per se, right? Like they don't really, and I don't, and this isn't a knock on them per se, because they yeah. do a lot of stuff right. But I think one of the things that they don't do well is I don't think they set their agents and their reps up for success once they become an agent or a rep. It's kind of at that point, it feels like go figure it out. And you see a lot of those guys selling LERPs as a core asset. And you see a lot of them selling LERPs that skew heavy on insurance for commission based. Basis, right? Which the average, when you ask the average client, hey, did you know that you could put a certain premium dollar into a policy and you could design it all the way where it has little insurance or all the way where it has tons of insurance or anywhere in between? And did you know that it'll have a completely different outcome on your financial life depending on it? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> mm -hmm. I actually, what I think the biggest value to Northwestern Mutual as a company is their culture. Yeah. Um, 
how it's executed on, I think maybe, you know, you're right. They spend a lot more of their time focused on the under five-year advisor and that's for, you know, sustainability for the company. But the culture of the Northwestern mutual company, I think is, is remarkable. There's a lot of um, joint work advocacy. It's planning focused. They advise on permanent insurance where it comes in. I, and I do think just like any other permanent insurance sales group, um, mm-hmm. it's often overprescribed. But I don't think that's I don't think that's unique to that organization. No, um, the things I, I wish that Northwestern Mutual advisors and distribution people had was a little bit more critical capability about which product made sense and why. And that's not taught there. And that was the reason I left. It wasn't because of being told to sell something I didn't believe in. Because once I understood it and once I found where it made value, it was finding the right t- client to purchase it. It made sense for them. What I didn't like was the lack of critical analysis against their products for other products. They weren't the only product in town. And I thought that in order to be a really comprehensive planner, you had to have that. And that's, that's why I went independent was because I wanted to not be tied to one carrier. I didn't want to have a quota by one carrier and the inability to show other groups. It's also why I've done what I've done in the premium financing space is that many of the you know, many of the aggregators that are out there, many of the teams that just focus on joint work here, they have a player's card. They have one bank they go to or two banks they go to mm-hmm. for every case. They don't critically analyze where all the capital is. And so that's really my thesis on this is that you have to be independent of carrier and you have to be independent of lender. And that's the only way you can drive value to the client. That's the way I believe you drive value to a client is by taking a, a full market analysis approach to both sides of the conversation. Understood and agreed. And look, my statement about Northwestern Mutual, yes, Northwestern Mutual was the name that fit in there, but it's any other captive organization that has brand equity. Completely agree. That's what I meant when I said you just happen to have personal relationships with Northwestern. That's why I use it as an example. But I don't think people realize that sometimes. And since we are kind of trying to educate the community as a whole, right? Like when you run into somebody that you know the name brand, there's a benefit to that. There's a cost associated with that as well. And it's this myopic focus, maybe a lack of training upon how to triage a situation, but come in head first with this flagship or core type solution, right? And yeah, what I advise everyone to do on their insurance is to ask, hey, how are you going to determine what's the best fit for me? Number one, and then number two, and what was the result of that? Because I don't want someone to show up and say, well, you know, we here's your quote for insurance. It's this company and it's the best. And I, I always want to know why. What is the rules that you're using? What is the, you know, what are the assumptions or what are the What's the way you're going to grade this? How are you going to determine first and foremost, what's best and then plug everything that's out there into it? You can't go backwards. And that's what I think happens a lot of times is that we're, we're backwards facing. You show up with the Northwestern policy and then you find out all the, then you explain all the reasons why it's the best versus saying, here's how we're going to grade it and then plug it into it with other things and have the output say, this is the one that's most efficient. That's the engineering mindset though. It's just a right. grading scale. Right. And that's a function of training and education, which, and I tell people this all the time, unfortunately, the financial services system is built on distribution. It's not built on education and execution. Those are not the same things. So, um, you know, education, training, and all that stuff actually matters, um, you know, so, um, but that's why brand equity for these companies is a thing because it allows you know, a rep to, that is has their business card to hand it to a client and say, hey, if Northwestern Mutual trust me, you should trust me, right? So, and maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think anytime you're having a, a 22-year-old go and give financial advice without uh, significant training more than here's how you sell, that to me, yeah, that's a little less, less sincere. I, I really would like to see more of an apprenticeship program. It's expensive, but I think that People who are coming out of college who want to get into this career full time, I think working underneath somebody and, and building out plans before you're selling them makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's, you know, well, I say this all the time our health and our wealth are directly correlated, right? Mm-hmm. And so in the financial services space, you can get a 30 day license and then you can go out and you say, here's your license. Now go tell people about financial services products, right? There's no mandate for an undergraduate degree. There's no graduate degree mandate. There's no board finals. There's no comprehensive exam. There's no apprenticeship or anything like that. And they're like, and learn some financial services stuff along the way while you're selling products to people. 
Imagine if we did that in the medical industry. You took a 30-day medical license, they handed you your scalpel and they go, please learn some medical stuff over the next few years while you're helping clients, right? That sounds crazy, but the yeah. world in from a regulatory standpoint is trying to you know, create fiduciary standards and best interests. And it's all these regulatory things. Why not just raise the minimum standard of what it takes to be an insurance advisor or a financial advisor or whatever that is, right? Yeah. So if you raise the quality of the human capital in the equation, the whole equation solves for a better solution, right? Yeah. And I look at this and I go, you know, to be an investment advisor and be able to talk about um, equities and, and a plan around that, or to be a, be a, to get your CFP, to go through that process, to be licensed, to go and give financial advice, there's a much higher bar. And I look at the complexity of the things that you and I talk about in life insurance specifically, and then you throw it into tax planning, then you throw it into financing planning. And I go, this is such a complicated structure there's no reason that someone with a 30 day license and no history in this should be allowed. To, they know enough to be dangerous and that's what they are. They're dangerous. They don't know enough to not be dangerous. And that's what we need to get to. Yep. I agree with that hundred percent. I think it's a human capital issue. And unfortunately the system was built for distribution and it's a thing that execution really matters. Right. So that's why they make doctor, you know, look, doctors, lawyers, CPAs all have that higher level of training. Just the industry, please, please industry, train reps better, make them have real education. Clients will get better outcomes. Let's, you know. Well, and I, and I think a lot of this comes down if you follow the money, Matt, and this is not a popular opinion, but insurance commissions are a sales commission, not a service commission. You don't get paid for execution. You know, like, just like you said, it's, it, you get paid to sell the thing. And so there's no responsibility other than goodwill and maybe liability to, for the advisor to sit there and work alongside the client on a, a big permanent insurance installation. If they change their agent of record or if they have their CPA or their attorney start reviewing things, that they're not getting paid for it. They're paying for that person's time. I think that's a big opportunity in this space. Um, not going to be popular because you know, everyone, I think, who sells insurance enjoys the way the commission is lumped up front. Um, but I truly believe that having that be spread out over a longer period of time would tie the interest of the client with the expected service and necessary service from the advisor. I would make the argument that if you, if you made 1% in perpetuity on every asset that you ever sold, whether it was an investment, insurance, or whatever, you would, and you started with an apprenticeship, and your residual income grew over time as you helped more people, then you never have somebody that as a rep ultimately has to sell more products to people. Eventually you shift from a sales business to a service business over time because you built your client base. And I think there's a lot more goal alignment with people. I think that's also an unpopular opinion. <laughs> yep. But I think it's right. You know, that's why uh, investment advisors are on the phone every time there's a downturn in the market because they're there their financial well-being is at risk if the client does a, makes a mistake, if they pull out at the wrong time, if they go and they have an emotional reaction to a situation that's in, in violation of their goals that they've set. That's their job is to keep them on track. And mm -hmm. they have something at stake to make sure it happens. So I, I switched firms. I left a firm I was with at the end of last year to go uh, build my own premium financing team. And one of the clients that I worked with, we took about a year and a half um, to put together a, a big installation for his estate planning. And when I left, his request was that I stay on because I'd, I'd worked so closely with him and his family. And I told him, I said, you know, Alan, my, the compensation's already paid out, but I'm in. I committed to you and we worked together. We were going to, we were going to do this. And I go, that's goodwill on my part. And I hope there's a lot of advisors that are like that, but his immediate response, he's an attorney is, well, you should get paid every year. That way you're enticed to stay on. He's like, you should have a reason to be here. And if that means I need to pay you every year to stay on board, he's like, that makes sense to me. And it started to click that someone who's service-based, someone who's thinking like that knows that you get what you pay for. And I think that having those kind of agreements in place are really important. There's a, especially in the insurance world, there is a long time frame where this stuff has to pan out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things that have to go right, depending on how much risk you take in the policy creation or design mm -hmm. and having that continuously reviewed, you should be part of the conversation up front. Here's my agreement to you. And here's what happens if I violate it. I just don't know how you do that though. 
Yep. Well, look, cost is only an issue in the absence of value. And that guy leaned into the opportunity because he felt value, right? Mm -hmm. um, you did the right thing and you explained it and you educated them. And that's what I said. Look, that's a human capital issue, right? Yeah. That's really what that is. And not all in, look, we're training is one thing, how you're wired is another. And we're not every, you know, some guys are just not in it for that. That's not their deal. So, and they don't get paid for it. I mean, to be fair, I understand their perspective. It's a sales contract. I get yeah. it. Yeah. You know, a lot of the guys, what I hear is, that's the insurance carrier's problem now. My job was to go make the contract happen. It's their job to fulfill it. Right. That's not how I think about it, but that's Me, out there. Yeah, I'm not a, not a fan. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the second question that somebody should ask your insurance agent. After you sell me this contract, whose responsibility is it to service it? Yours as an agent or the carrier's? <laughs> what I found is I like to actually just avoid the question having to be asked by presenting, here's what the next 12 months of our engagement looks like. These are important dates that we're going to have. Uh, for financing cases, I think there's a little bit more services to go into it than you know, traditional policy, but here's where we're going to start requesting updated illustration. Here's where we're going to um, confirm crediting. Here's where we're going to reach out to you to post more collateral to make an interest payment for next year. Here's where you should start receiving premium payment notices because I want them to know ahead of time, here's our roadmap for 12 months or 13 months actually. And having that delivered up front, it takes me all the way back to what I said at the beginning, which is what impressed me about the financial services industry from Brian, who got me into it, was being proactive and doing what you say. And you can't do what you're going to say if you don't say what you're going to do. And so that's where you show up with a plan for the next 13 months. And I think it just, it takes that burden off of you. It takes a burden off the client. You can always refer back to that. Insurance is something that's, you know, retail insurance, when we're talking about whole life or IULs or ULs, you know, these are some that change on a yearly basis, typically. So there's not a lot to do between those spaces, but letting the client know exactly what's going to happen in their advisory team. This way we can plan a meeting, you know, 12 months away, 13 months away. If there's a family office involved, it's understanding for them. When are you doing reporting? What are the, are you doing quarterly reporting? I work with a, a family office here in Fashion Island as well. And when they come back out, they want to report to the family on a quarterly basis. These are your assets. These are your global assets. These are your distribution. These are the values. I look at them and go, what is your when when and how do you want me to report information to you because this is an asset that should also be on your report to the client mm -hmm. yeah so i want to sum so for people listening on the podcast i want to bring up a point right here life insurance is not a set it and forget it deal it's something that needs to be reviewed on an annual basis whether it's whole life whether it's index universal life whether it's universal life what it, even if it's a term policy because there's conversion opportunities and stuff along the way and you need to revisit those so a lot, i think a lot of people think oh insurance is a set it and forget it thing once i make the decision it's done put the policy in the drawer and this is from somebody that's an expert saying no this is something that needs to be revisited on an annual basis it might not be the longest meaning in the world there might not be a lot of changes but it needs to be looked at just to make sure that the market hasn't changed right yeah that's exactly right so the other thing if you know insurance carriers change too. throw that in there is that you know if you bought a policy in 1997 from transamerica that you thought was a guaranteed contract and then you go through cost of insurance changes that's a carrier that because of some choices they made they had to start raising cost of insurance those were unexpected but the writing was on the wall much earlier than when they started effectuating it. So an advisor who is up to date currently on distribution and, and understanding, they could have gone to a client and said, I don't like the route this is going. This is now we have uncertainty here about what their response is going to be. Let's look and see if we can pivot now before things become too expensive to pivot or your health changes and you don't qualify for anything else. Right. I mean, because what we're really talking about is this pivots a little bit into a little bit of a different conversation, but there are exit strategies for life insurance, right? You have options. There's not just pay it or don't pay it. You know what I'm saying? Or cancel the policy or surrender the policy or take the cat, whatever. There's always options. So, you know, having an educated conversation about what your options are, where this is going, you know, if it starts to move south now, what's it going to look like in three to five years? So, you know, that's an annual conversation. It might not be a long conversation, but it's a conversation. This is hey, here's where this is going. This is a living, breathing opportunity. Tax code change, you know, financing rates change, like lots of, lots of moving targets. So it's just like real estate, 
what I think about that is that you may have bought a house or you may have bought a condo. And if you think about your insurance policy that way, you got to figure out, is the neighborhood still good? Is the cap rate still there? Should I sell it? Um, should we live in it? Should we rent it out? Those are all options. And insurance policy is the same way. Um, I think, you know, one thing people don't think about a lot, especially those who are taking policy loans, is what's the most efficient way to tap into equity in the contract? You know, what I get to see is I get to see banks who specialize in giving loans against in-force insurance at a lower rate than what the insurance carrier will charge you for your own loan. You're talking about a CVLOC. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when that iteration came out, but it's in the past few years that that became kind of now you Google it and you can find 30 banks online that'll, that you can set up an application. But yeah, the loan rate on those policies is less than what the loan rate is or the loan rate from those banks using the policy as collateral is less than what you can borrow from out of the policy itself. So yeah, yeah. it's a more efficient use of cost of capital. Yeah, that's right. And if you call me, I've already called all those 30 banks and I'll, I'll just walk you through where to go. There you go. There that's, you go. That was that's it. Boom. You ran it. You drove a truck through that opportunity, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I've been doing with all these banks is figuring out where, you know, it's a murky world of lending right now. There's not a centralized repository. And so that's what I'm building. I'm building the, the centralized the database of lenders in the, in the life insurance space. I got you. Let me pivot and ask a question. I want to go back to some notes I made before. So, and you don't have to get into the names of it, but number of carriers out there, if you were going to consider a premium finance option, right? Because I'm going to use Northwestern Mutual because we talked about them before. If a Northwestern mm -hmm. guy walks in, you're buying a Northwestern policy, right? He's yeah. a Northwestern guy. You as an independent insurance consultant, if you're going to put together the structure, how many different carriers are you potentially shopping and looking at to determine what's the best fit from an insurance perspective? I think there's probably 25 that makes sense to look at right now. Um, that typically come to the top. I think a lot of them are self-deselected based on internal costs. Sure. That's what I drive this on is in inherent guarantees, financial strength in the company and inherent cost structure. And so I think the products change probably every three to six months at each carrier, depending on what their strategy is, especially going through some of those regulatory changes. So I just run the marketplace every time. I'll work with the BGA who's going to run the marketplace for me. I don't look at what's illustrated and how great can it be. I want to know what are the internal cost structure and guarantees. Um, that's how I judge the efficiency of a product. Um, that being said, the, the Northwestern Mutual case we worked on last year, um, we ended up using 26 carriers to put together their portfolio. Okay. So we, I mean, we had to go out to the market for a giant uh, retention stacking case. Sure, sure. Understood. Um, so same question, but from a lender perspective, how many, when you're initially putting a finance structure in place, how many potential lenders would you have a conversation with to try to shop that to get the best loan rate? There's, there's about 25 right now on my platform and they start to self deselect really quick though. That's part of what I look at is each lender in this space has unique requirements for the type of loan they do, whether it's cash value letter, a line of credit, or whether it's financing new or financing existing. There's transactional banks that are more the, you know, there's private banks, which are relationship lending. Um, so if a client is willing to move assets or already has a private banking relationship, that's a place to go. There's transactional lenders who exclusively finance the insurance and don't require any other relationship. Um, there's kind of hybrids in between that where some will require collateral to be held on site, but I'll go out to, there's about 25 on the platform right now. And it breaks down typically each case I get about six competing quotes. And what I do is I'll come back to the client the same way I would on insurance, on insurance for design is here's what the current market of lending looks like. Here's the efficiencies and the requirements for each one uh, before we ever put an application. And it's just like a, it's a pre-qualification process I've built. Sure, sure. So I've heard it before, but when banks compete, you win, right? That's well, I, I'll tell you what, what's nice about this is there's twofold. One, they compete with each other. Two, I guess there's multiple things. Two, I give them insight on what's going on in the market. So if a bank is on my platform, part of that, you know, part of my commitment back to them is sharing what else, what other banks were offering on that deal. I won't give them the names of them, but I want them to see the range of rates and deal structures that they know. Here's why you didn't win this case. The client want the client valued this and this, and it's that data that's important to them. They don't have access to. Um, the second thing, or the next thing, is that because 
the way I approach the financing, I do the underwriting internally. Just like if you have a, a client that's buying a $100 million contract, you're never going to have them fill out a formal application or send any medical records to the insurance carrier until you've already had a team review it and go through and make sure it's ready to be signed, sealed, and delivered. I do the same thing on the financing. So I go through all of the client's financials so that once we select that bank that's already gone through pre-qualification and made an informal offer indication, when the client says go, that bank instantly gets a cover letter and a full document package, organized, labeled, titled to guide them through so that their credit committee is like this. And they give me points for that. They reduce the rates the client gets because of the way I approach them. Nice. That's definitely value added. Yeah, for sure. And the other thing, so not every bank's going to get a deal. Not a bank, every bank's going to get a deal every year, but at least they know why. Right. No, it makes sense. Um, another question on that from a lender perspective, mm -hmm. and this is because they're different parts of the market and they lend in different ways. Lenders for premium finance versus lenders that do a CVLOC, how much overlap is though in there in those lenders? It depends on how big of a policy it is. I think that's where it comes into is that if we're looking at a contract that's 25 to $250,000 of cash value, you're trying to add, that's going to be maybe two or three banks in that will overlap. Uh, but primarily there'll be banks that focus exclusively on one or the other. Once you get higher than that, if you have a client with $500,000 or more of cash value, even though it's not offered normally, I can go to my transactional banks and use them to create a, a CVLOC type structure. It's going to depend on how the client wants to use it. If the client wants it truly as a letter of credit or line of credit, that they can tap, write checks, they're going to use it randomly. Right. I think the, the banks that specialize in it are going to be better. If the client is going to do, and this is what I typically see, they're going to borrow as much cash out of it as they can. They're going to deploy it in real estate. They're going to carry the interest until it makes sense to pay off. I actually will take those and have my premium financing lenders quote as well, because we can usually get a better rate. It's just not, it's not structured the same. Gotcha. So there is some overlap. Okay. Yeah. Said, and I didn't mention this on here. CVLOC is cash value line of credit. Mm -hmm. So for people like using an acronyms, I try not to use it. Another one is there's, you might've heard of SVLOC, securities back line of credit. So sometimes somebody will take a securities portfolio somewhere, create a line of credit against that and use that as their finance funding because it's collateralized, not necessarily just capitalized. Um, but a CVLOC works in a very similar but different way. And I think is a, I don't think five years ago I had heard of a CVLOC. Is it newer than five years? They did. They, it wasn't really labeled as that. What they would talk about it is loan rescue. That was the term you might've heard five years ago, where if you had, if you had an enforced policy that you had been allowing the cash value to pay or the dividends to pay the premium and things kind of got out of control, they would call it a, um, I trying to remember the term they would use. It's like a policy rescue loan where they would loan the money to the insurance carrier the bank would make a loan. It would go directly to the insurance carrier. They would take collateral of the insurance contract. And that was to make it healthy enough to keep going because it was less expensive to pay interest to the bank than it was to make all the premium payments to the carrier yourself. Gotcha. Understood. And it's just, there's a, they become cost of capital issues, cost issues. Where's the cheapest source of money that I can put into this policy and make it do what it needs to do, right? Yeah. I think one of the neat things here, you know, I, I have a client right now, I, I have a call here. It's supposed to start in five minutes. So I'm going to ping him and tell him we're running a little over, but you know, I guess 400,000 of one, 50,000 out of another and 50,000 out of another. So about half a million dollars of loans against his enforced insurance. And there's some legacy, you know, some legacy New York life, universal life policies in there. And that has a guaranteed crediting of 4%. And I look at cost of capital today, and even with the recent raise in the Fed rates, it hasn't trickled to the point where we're over 4% yet. And so I look at that and I go, I know he wants to borrow money against the cash value, but what we're going to look at on top of that is, is there capacity to fund more? Because right. if I can fund it more, we might be able to get him in a better position just globally while interest rates are low and have it self-support itself. What kind of rates are you seeing on the CVLOCs today? If, on that, if, for five hundred thousand, we'll probably be uh, mid to low threes. Okay, gotcha. Makes sense. Um, something that I made notes on that I wanted to double back. You said the people that you wanted to focus on that you wanted to help primarily were business owners, right? Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk about the reasons, the fact patterns, the use cases for why you help a business owner finance a policy. Now I want to double back because I want to, you know, there's three primary reasons that you listed is that number one, they, they have to have the money for funding. There mm-hmm. needs to be a better use case for the personal access and they have to have a bona fide need for life insurance, right? Which I agree with all those things. But what are the problems in a business that a business owner can solve if they meet those three criteria by using a leveraged life insurance solution? Well, I think there's there's multiple. You know, if you go down the order of, of problems that life insurance helps solve, you know, number one is... Uh, it's building an optionality, depending on how much free cash flow or how much capability and flexibility the, the family has. In the event of death of the primary business owner, oftentimes we see it where the spouse is, is going to step in, spouse or the next generation. They're going to they're gonna have a learning curve to take it over. It hasn't been a fully baked succession plan. It hasn't been fully trained and transitioned. And so insurance gives you some capital to hire consultants, to hire people to come in and help, and also some some room to breathe for the family where they're not so stressed out about solving those problems immediately. They can grieve, and then they can go and start solving these things. That's a need for insurance at ICR. That's a solution that insurance can provide. Um, The bigger issues, though, whenever we get into clients that have built significant corporations. And we're talking probably 40 million of a business that is a 40 million valuation plus is that not only is there going to be an issue with who takes over and runs the business in that transition, there's also a tax issue that if it's all in generation one's estate and generation one passes unexpectedly or prematurely, there's going to be not only a transfer issue for leadership, but there's going to be a issue of how do we you know, how do we pay the tax bill that's due? The government's going to step in and say, hey, the first $25 million of this business goes for free today in 2022. And the other 15 million goes at a 40% tax rate federally. So, you know, you have a $6 million, uh, you have a $6 million tax bill due to the government. So not only do you have to figure out how to hire consultants, do the transfer of the business, but you have a tax bill due as well. And so what we'll look at is using a life insurance to pay that estate tax obligation. Um, The third thing is that oftentimes business owners who have large, closely held corporations, their business is the primary asset in their estate. So those two things can't be looked at in complete silos because we can't have the insurance owned directly by the business that would increase the value of the business because now it's just going to hurt on the estate tax transfer. So now you have to start getting into more complex planning, which is do we create a special purpose LLC? that owns a buy-sell agreement or a transfer agreement of the corporation and have it own the insurance and have the owners of that corporation be a trust for the benefit of generations two plus of the the matriarch and patriarch. And then if that's the case, it's how do you actually fund it? And this is where premium financing becomes a really interesting perspective because that may be a special purpose vehicle that has no assets. There's no free cash flow there. It doesn't own the business. It owns the right to buy the business. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get capital into it, we use the matriarch patriarch's balance sheet. We use the corporate balance sheet to qualify for the loan, but the bank makes the loan directly to that entity and that entity purchases the life insurance. This insulates it so it's not ever part of the the includable estate for estate tax purposes and starts eliminating problems. So that's another reason we look into it. Other things, if you're going through a, a, a transition, if you're going through a liquidity event, you know, I, I have a friend here who recently sold his company. Um, he's 36. He sold two thirds of his business to a private equity firm. He's got, you know, a plan to sell the other third of it in uh, two to three years whenever they go through a full transition. So he's got this PE company that still has him running the corporation. And they have a lot of issue with if he were to pass keeping the business running. And so now you look at key person coverage, which is a very normal conversation piece. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and go, Hey, Mike, you know, the PE firm and you should insulate this transaction by ensuring your life. And so what we do is we find, because we don't want to, we don't deploy the cash flow. Cash flow. this business is growing leaps and bounds. The injection of money from the PE firm, their money is getting great return. I look at that and go, we can finance insurance on for a low, low cost for you own that by the corporation for the benefit of the corporation to support this transfer. It helps increase the value of the business by providing a transition funding mechanism and 
as part of the final buyout, we're going to have them pay off the loan and transfer the insurance policy to you. So now not only are you going to have a $100 million liquidity event, you're going to have a $50 million insurance policy that already insulates that. So your family doesn't have to, you know, have to figure out how to come up with liquidity for that, uh, for a state tax transfer and start building generational wealth. It starts insulating generational wealth. That's the one thing I always say is that life insurance doesn't make you rich, but it can keep you that way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It makes a lot, There's a of, lot of, a lot of things there. Yeah, yeah, a lot to impact. But you look, you know, you're, what you're talking about, key person, buy, sell, you know, liquidity events. I mean, it's not, you know, paying taxes, common use cases for it, but it's not buying life insurance for the sake of buying life insurance, right? We're solving problems with life insurance as a tool. I think many times what I found in my experience is most business owners don't typically have good relationships with financial advisors. And the reason why is financial advisors are commonly trying to pull assets out of the business and put them in five, six, seven, eight percent return products where the business's return on equity is 20 percent. Right. And the business owner is thinking, why would I take money out of my business when it's getting 20 and put it into something over here in your portfolio that's going to get six. Right. But what you're talking about from an insurance and a risk management perspective is, yes, we know you could get 20 over here or better. Right. But let's make sure that if you can wake up, dress up and show up and keep going to work, you can do those things. But what happens if you can't do those things? Then what happens for the other people that aren't as sophisticated as you are? We have to put some risk management in place. And that's ultimately what this is, right? Yeah, that would drive the need for the life insurance is to keep the business running. And the reason I focus on this, I always think about keeping the family farm in the family. If that's important to you is to hold on to that. And a lot of people's family farm is their business they've built. Sure. They spent 20, 30, 50 years you know, creating this entity, hiring these people. They have a couple hundred or a couple thousand employees that look up to you know, their leadership. And this is a way to be, you know, to kind of take off, take off your stakeholder hat and say, I'm not just the shareholder uh, and put on the chairman of the board hat, which is how do we make sure that the enterprise value of this entity continues to be, you know, continues to grow continues to be meaningful. And that's when that hat kind of changes place. I think that's where a lot of people see the value of insurance, which is they have a lot of concentrated risk on that one individual or two individuals. And then to your point, this, I mean, this is exactly where I look for financing as a strategy is that if you can deploy, if you have a hundred million dollar company and you're looking at a $20 million insurance policy for some, you know, estate tax planning and transfer planning, that may cost you six or $7 million over your lifetime to fund that. And I go six or $7 million when you're earning 20% is a different cost than six or $7 million when you're earning 5%. Mm -hmm. So if this is competing with a lower cost, lower risk asset versus your business, it actually costs more. And so that's where if I can get somebody a loan to fund six or $7 million of premium, and it's going to cost them two or 3% interest, it just doesn't make sense not to. What we focus on then is in the future, once that 20% compounding has happened long enough, there's going to be one of two things that's going to happen, or actually one of three things. One, it doesn't go as planned. And so we need to have the insurance as a backup. That's why we use contracts with strong guarantees versus taking even more risk in the insurance. That's typically my advice is let's de-risk the whole plan by using lower risk insurance contracts. Or number two, the business is going to benefit from all that injected capital staying in the business. And we're going to start putting some of the liquidity and the cash flow that happens down the road, 10 or 20 years from now, to start repaying and amortizing the loan that funded the insurance, or they're going to have a liquidity event. And now all of a sudden what they have is they have this pool of liquidity and they're looking for more places to deploy it. And they can rebalance their global portfolio by taking a chunk of cash, repaying the loan and owning the insurance on their balance sheet. That's right. That's right. So I'm going to and I know we're running short on time. I got a couple thoughts I want to close up on. This has been good. You're high energy explaining this topic, so I like it. So in long-term care planning, 93% of people that have experienced a long-term care event will plan for long-term care because they experienced someone that went through the event, right? So the easiest way to determine if somebody will buy long-term care or plan for long-term care is, hey, do you know anyone that's ever gone through a long-term care experience and how did that affect their family and their finances? If they have a story, there's a high mm. probability they'll want to do something, right? Yeah. So 
I would say that that's analogous to business planning as well, right? If they, if the business owner themselves doesn't know anyone that's ever personally had a premature death or disability that never, that impacted the ownership or the highly compensated structure of the business and therefore how it runs, I find it hard for them to want to move because I'm durable, I'm smart, this is never gonna happen to me, it's not my scenario. So the reason I preframe that is to say, what story or what examples do you have of other stories of maybe famous scenarios that you would use to go, hey, I know you think that this isn't going to happen to you. You're 10 foot tall bulletproof. But this guy didn't have it, think it was going to happen to him. And this person didn't either. And they were clearly wrong. So <laughs> that's funny. I, uh, I don't have the stories on the other side. What I typically focus on is smart generational wealth planning. The clients that focus on this they have assets they're going to make an impact much longer than they do. And that's where I, that's what I like to talk about is um, I spend as much or more time talking to people about what they want to do, how they've built what they've done and what they want to do with it long-term. Cause that's interesting to me. That's when I think about the impact planning, I like to talk with people and say, Hey, what's your strategy for this? Are you, are you the kind of person who's going to build this all up and you want your kids to run the business? Is that important to you? Do you want your kids to, to, to step in and, and have different kinds of a different kind of life? And I like to just shut up and listen because the fact is most of these business owners, most of these people who have built these extremely successful corporations, I'm going to learn from them, not the other way around. I'm going to learn from them what it's like to build something that's that valuable, that's that impactful, that takes care of that many people. I'm going to listen more than I'm going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is the mechanics of insurance. I'm going to talk about how to be efficient, how to be clear and critical on those pieces, how to vet good advisors. But as far as the planning goes, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I want to know. I want another plan. I have one client who you know, his goal was he wants to give each kid $10 million. That's his investment in them. Um, he wants each one of them to go and live the life they want. He grew up from nothing. And that's the end of his goal is that he he doesn't want to bog them down with rules for distribution. He doesn't want to bog them down with um, limitations for what they can invest in or when they can take money or how he goes, I want them just to have the lump sum and go live their life. I have another client who sold his company for $400 million. And he goes, my kids, my kids are already receiving their inheritance. They're receiving their inheritance because I will invest in any business venture they bring to the table, but I make them report to me like I'm an investor. So I'm giving them the experience of being an entrepreneur and the opportunity for it if that's what they choose. He's like, they're not getting any lump sums. They're not getting any money. I'm not buying them things. I'm investing in them so that they feel they can go and make the impact of the world that they want. These are areas I've never had to deal with. I've not, we don't have kids yet. Um, mm -hmm. I look at the efficiency of assets. That's the brain I bring to the table but I bring my curiosity to the table and it's them walking through and explaining. And a lot of times that's where I, I start off with this mentality all the time, Matt, at the beginning of every conversation, my assumption is that the other, the client does not need life insurance. And it's not till it's proven to me that they do for part of their planning that we even start to figure out how it can work. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, I think that's the best way to go into it, right? This may, or, I, this may or may not be something that's a fit for you or anything that's going on in your financial life. But before I could do that, I need to know more about what's going on in your financial life. That's what called, um, you know, you have to have diagnosis before you can have prescription, right? Yeah. And too many people in the financial services space walk in with a prescription and throw it down on the table and say, here you go. And I think that's, that's a problem. And the other part is, you know, on pre-call, we talked a little bit. I think you grew up a little bit like me. You didn't have a lot. You weren't one of these wealthy clients, right? That's, I wasn't either. Far but from now, having access to so many wealthy clients like I do, um, I've had the opportunity to sit down and have those conversations. Sometimes they've been a full day long, right? And I call it their origin story. You know, how they got to where they're at, what they learned, the obstacles they faced, the, the bad things that happened, the good things that happened, the unintended consequences, the doors that opened, you know, um, but you can learn so much from those other people. And like, you know, it, it's been great to get to hear those stories and learn from people and how they got to where they're at. And sometimes it was meant to be and other times it was an accident or a happy accident, you know, and 
or they survived some ridiculous peril along the way and, and, and still persisted. So yeah. it sounds like you get a lot of that in what you're doing by asking questions and listening to the story. And uh, I find that to be one of the most interesting parts of what it is that I do is learning through, you know, a 40 year life cycle of somebody's business journey, what they did to get to where they're at and hearing the highlight reel version of it is, you know, it's, it's invaluable. Well, it's great because it it also helps in the in the growth of our business. Where you know we have I have a technical capability in this space, but um, also building it for more scale. I I turn to some of my clients as as member people on my board, my personal board and my and my business board, and that's exciting because they bring to the table. Here's what I've liked about working with you. Here's what I've liked about working with other people. Here's what I think would be more valuable. And when people have that kind of stake, you know that's what's driven this whole family office reporting initiative is if clients that have a multifamily office that want to include their insurance assets in a transparent way. They're sick of, they're sick of every other asset being reported one way and the insurance being reported a different way. And sure. so it's just translating, it's helping get there. And that's not something I would have thought of, but because they have a need for it, now we can offer it to more people. I love that. And not every client wants that. Not every client wants to you know, go down and, and share their whole origin story. And that's okay too. You know, if I need to be an advisor and, and just give it, then I, I like to dote on my clients. I love helping people who are helping the world. You know, fun fact, the, the reason I thought about even, the reason I, I said yes to this career and being in finance at all, uh, in 2006, Elon Musk started SpaceX um, or he was, SpaceX was growing at that point. And I looked at him and said, this guy's helping the world get to outer space. And he's doing it by going out and making a big impact to a lot of people and then bringing his war chest of capital and investing in space. And I go, that's what I want to do. I'm going to go out to the world and, and use what I have to serve others, grow my capital, and then invest it in the space. And so I had to talk to a lot of people about space aspirations. And uh, I, you know, sailing is one thing. Space is a whole another whole nother dimension. Uh, but that's my big driver. That's my why is helping, helping people go to outer space and live there. I saw a snippet on, on Elon yesterday on something and it was like somebody was interviewing him and said, so this is just some billionaires thing about you want to show how cool you are by going to Mars or whatever in your lifetime. And he goes, really cool. He goes, I'm probably going to die. He goes, don't know how I'm going to get back. I'm going to have to work the whole time that I'm there. You know, <laughs> he's like, this isn't like a vanity thing. This is just, you know, something that he wants to do. Right. It's, so it's kind of a, an interesting perspective. People that are on the outside um, view it differently differently than people that are on the inside. You know, I think the world is, you know, some of these clients because you work with them, but the world today almost vilifies a high net worth client that is creating business, creating industry, creating jobs, you know, tech innovation, tech disruption, you know, making lives better in the future. Those aren't easy opportunities to lean into because the world is saying, no, you can't, or you shouldn't. And, you know, this is not the status quo. And then now the public narrative is those people are villains. They're terrible. And we should tax them to death because, you know, the government could be a re better reallocator of wealth than a wealthy person trying to create a new industry per se, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the way I always describe it is that, you know, business owners and those who are successful, they're lightning rods for litigation. It's just, you know, the nature of, of the way that our litigious society works is that you go after those who have deep pockets because if things fall out, it may not be noticeable to them, but it's noticeable to those who receive it. Um, you know, that's why I think insurance, life insurance specifically is a really interesting asset class for that too, just the way that it has some uh, protection mechanisms built in and the way that it's owned. And I think most of the time when I'm talking to clients, it's talking about how do you protect yourself from predatory creditors? How do you protect yourself from um, you know, taxes that are the impact of taxes to your transfer? And so when you start looking at efficiency and protection and control, that's that's what drives all the conversation. The insurance is just a byproduct to get there. It's just the tool. Yeah. Yep. It's just the tool that solved. I to ask guys all the time that are selling annuities in the annuity business. I'm like, what are the two primary benefits of an annuity? And no one ever gets it right. I'm like, it's tax deferral and creditor protection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's and it's fundamental tenets. This is what it does, right? You're talking about the crediting or all this other stuff, or whatever. I'm like, it's tax deferral and creditor protection. Those are things that an annuity can do that other right. products can't do. Those are its attributes, right? Yeah, it's the benefit of it, the tax code behind it. Yeah.
Yeah. But so, yes. Yeah, and life insurance has some of those unique benefits as well, but it's not an end all be all Swiss army knife solution. It's a potential tool that falls into some certain fact patterns and solves it more elegantly than other ways. Right. That's, that's it. it. Yeah, that's it. It's not the end all be all. I think it's part of the conversation. It's a neat one. And whenever you look at a balance sheet, you know, assuming the maturity value is paying out, it, oftentimes it becomes a very highly concentrated portion of a client's balance sheet. Sure. Um, especially in the high net worth space, you know, we're, when we look at a, a half billion dollar client that has two hundred and forty million dollars of death benefit in force, that's a significant portion of their estate. And what better institution than to have it within the American Life Insurance Groups? And that's you know, what it comes down to: is these are the backbone of our nation is on these insurance carriers' back. They invest everywhere all the time in our country and and they believe in it and they're made for the greater good and that's what makes them interesting you know interesting people to have another side of a contract with sure sure understood well john it's been a pleasure today um you know i know we've gone a little longer than anticipated but it was fun and you've got some interesting stuff that you do in your life not everybody's a sailor not everybody's into you know being an astronaut <laughs> I find that not everybody's an engineer so that's that's you know just a nerdy guy who sells some life insurance that's all right. Nothing wrong with that. You know, um, the older you get, the more cool nerds get, right? <laughs> I've been saying it for a long time. So uh, this You're is making... great. Man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing everything on here today. How would people find you? What's the best way to find you? Uh, LinkedIn is actually the best way for me to go. That's um, most of my distribution conversations happens on there. I, I interact with professional clients. So it's John Reed Jr. There's rocket ships next to my name. And uh, that's the best way to get a hold of me or jreed at financed.life. Very good. Very good. Well, John, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for your time so much and your expertise. Thanks for sharing with the audience. Everybody, once again, we're going to close up today. This is Matt Chancy. This is the Tax Alpha Solutions Podcast. And um, hopefully we brought you some valuable and useful information today and um, so that you can make better decisions to get better outcomes in your financial life. So until next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tax Alpha Solutions brought to you by Matt Chancy. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts.